Caught rice. German, I was behind tab 23 in Jager and Land Rover, and you may still have that open. Yes. I was just coming to paragraphs 47, basically to 52, 47 to 51 of Mr. Uh, Mr. Justice Lidge's judgment in Denmark. Um, the reason I'm referring to this is because we specifically invoked it uh, when the matter came back before the judge ahead of the third judgment that he delivered. And not only did we invoke it once, but we invoked, it, invoked the same procedural requirements a second time round, and on both occasions they seem to have made absolutely no impression on the judge. May I ask you, please, to have a look at paragraphs 47 to 49, noting in particular 49. my lord gave him 50, unless the defendant can point to some narrow aspect which can be characterised as a fair specification, I don't see how he can establish that the claimant, in applying for a wider spec, acted in bad faith, as the whole premise of the allegation is that he was acting in a way that fell short of standards of acceptable commercial behaviour, and so on. That was this case. If I could ask you to close that bundle, and then I will start to uh, close the loop on to the third judgment now. Uh, may I ask you to turn to bundle SK, which is the other side's bundle, tab 29, SK2, tab 29. judgment. The parties were invited, more than invited, were instructed to return to the High Court in London to argue about what the judgment should be in the light of what the CJEU had said. This happened to be at the very earliest stages of last year's lockdown, and the parties agreed between themselves and the judge agreed with the parties that the matter should be dealt with on paper. Therefore, the judge received full written submissions, and we were given an opportunity on to put in written submissions in reply. And what I'm going to do now, with your Lordship's permission, is to show you um, some just two extracts. One extract from my first round of written submissions for that judgment, and then another extract from my second round of submissions. So if you're behind tab 29 in bundle SK2, may I ask you to turn to stamped page 425. Where you'll see that we have the heading partial as opposed to total invalidation. Now by now, my opponents had accepted that they couldn't succeed on what we've been calling their jackpot claim. They couldn't knock the whole lot out. So they had adopted the position that there must be some cancellation. That was how they were putting it. So we pick up the thread in paragraph 84 with the ruling on question 4 to the Court of Justice. And then in 85 of this skeleton on stamped page 426 and through to 87 on the next page, I won't say we implore, but we, we very firmly ask the judge to apply what we see and said was the cor correct and proper procedure to follow. We cited BDO, which was a decision of his own, and we gave the numbered paragraphs. He didn't refer to that in his judgment. 
and we cited Jaguar Land Rover, which is the paragraph I've just asked you to look at, 49 to 51. And we said that both judgments stand for the proposition that a party applying for cancellation who maintains the trademark in question is impermissibly registered for too broad a spec, is required to take stock and formulate on notice to the trademark proprietor the narrower spec which the court should impose. We said that this is the natural procedural consequence of giving effect to the rebuttable presumption of validity in adversarial proceedings. And we, we, we warmed to that theme in 87. If, contrary to Sky's contention, the court were to consider that Sky Kick may still put forward a claim for partial invalidation, that should be conditional upon them observing basic principles of justice and fairness by stating with clarity and precision the factual basis on which they maintain, if they do, that their claim can succeed and extend beyond the very few goods and services listed in the registrations of Sky's trademark, which were actually put to Mr. Tanzi, who was my client's witness on this point. None of those goods and services are germane to the infringement claim. Now, we, we raise that plea, and of course, we then get the other side's skeleton argument, and it doesn't actually confront, we, we don't think it did, and I don't think the judge did, as I show you, we don't think that it confronted the judgment of the Court of Justice, which had come in the meantime. So may I ask you to close that bundle and go with me briefly to bundle Sky, to Sky, two of two, Tab 25. We had permission of the judge to serve this uh, skeleton argument in reply. He hadn't previously directed it, but we raised the basis for saying that we should have the opportunity, and we took it. And we picked up on what we found really rather irritating in paragraph 9. There were places in the reply skeleton that had come in from the other side, replying to ours, which were raising the possibility of steps being taken without themselves actually and unequivocally taking it. And we quote from statements and expressions they put in their reply skeleton, if this, if that, and so on. We made the point in 10 that the possibility of the steps being taken is not only raised informally and extremely late, it's also being mooted conditionally in the reply skeleton in a way that is apt to result in them being seen as steps taken in reaction to judicial prompting in adversarial proceedings. We then cite, and parenthetically you may care to note, of course, that this is something that has been recently uh, uh, dealt with emphatically in the case of Satyam, Satyam Enterprises, in which my Lord Lord Justice Nuji delivered the judgment of the Court of Appeal some weeks ago, not very long ago. We cited earlier authority for much the same proposition, um, the fundamental principles being that the court has a non-advisory and non-inquisitorial role in adversarial proceedings in this country. And the other side shouldn't be just sitting ineffectively on the fence, waiting inappropriately for the court to guide them with regard to the presentation of their own case. And then we identify what we said ought to be happening. Paragraph 16, having correctly accepted in their reply skeleton that they can't succeed on their existing claim, that's the jackpot claim, the defendants go on to contend that the trademarks must be subject to some, the word some was underlined by them, partial invalidation. So we said that given that they're actively seeking to claim via their reply, without having previously formulated any claim to that effect, the next question immediately arises. Which listings are they actually asking the court to suppress by way of partial invalidation? On what factual basis do they maintain that the court should find that the requirements of a determination of bad faith, single inverted, 
in accordance with the legal criteria identified in the CJEU judgment are actually satisfied in relation to those listings. They had put forward a thing which they called Annex B and it's reappeared as Annex A to their skeleton on this appeal. We say in paragraph 21 in relation to Annex B, before it could, with the permission of the court, be treated as a claim for partial invalidity in accordance with the legal criteria, it would need to be formulated with as much particularity as any such claim would now need to be formulated in the aftermath of that judgment. We say what the question is, and we stand by this as to what the question is that the, should, the judge should have dealt with in his third judgment. On what factual basis do the defendants maintain that the court should find that the requirements for a determination of bad faith in accordance with the legal criteria identified in the CG, CJU judgment are actually satisfied in relation to the top eight listings itemised in Annex B? And the answer is that's not what they've set out to do. And what they had set out to do as, as is, as we've pointed out in paragraph 23, and as the judge went on to say in his judgment, they set out to treat it as if it was a non-use case, which the judge in his third judgment himself said is not the correct approach uh, for the purposes of determining the bad faith claim. It's not the equivalence of a non-use case. Now, we, we raised this in these two skeletons with the judge. Uh, it didn't happen. Now, what did happen is this. The, I'm, going to, I'm going to paraphrase it loosely. The judge wrote his third judgment, which is the principal judgment of liability, along the lines of, as I was saying. So, as I was saying in my main judgment. Now, what should have happened is this. He had not, in his main judgment, dealt with the itemised selected goods and services. His judgment does not deal with them. It was, ex it was absolutely necessary, when the case came back, for the judge to complete the process of conducting what I shall call, just loosely, an audit in relation to the eight itemised selected goods and services, and to apply the legal principles in the CJEU judgment and make an assessment on the evidence and the allegations which had been made in relation to them. Now, I just need to show you how the matter had come through in the main judgment before I go to the third judgment. So if, if you'll just be patient with me for a moment or two. In the core bundle, it's tab 12, the main judgment. <coughs> and the section, which is pertinent for present purposes, begins on stamped page 220. Got a heading above 235, paragraph 235, the facts in the present case. And this section runs through to, to 257. Right, so picking it up at 237, Sky accepted that it was their intention when filing, and those are the first two of the EU trademark registrations, and they were filed in 2003. And I wish to make a point on that while you have those two registrations, as it were, blipping on your radar screen. They were filed in 2003, and the only one of the itemised selected goods and services that they contained was telecommunications services. There is no challenge, there was no challenge to validity on telecommunication services, and there is no challenge to validity on this appeal to telecommunication services. And so those first two registrations are unassailably valid 
for the purposes of my client's infringement claim at <coughs> first instance and on appeal. Well, su subject to the tainting point. The, the tainting point that if you've got any applied for in bad faith, then it affects the whole... They're not running that. In, there's no challenge to validity on telecommunication services at all. I thought there was at one point. No. No, I, I can be clear on that. I am right, aren't I? And, and, and electronic mail. And, and likewise, there's no challenge at first instance or on appeal to electronic mail services for bad faith invalidity. You don't get to part cancellation on either of them. And that's been the case all the way through? Yeah. Even in the light of their point that... I've said this already, but... Yeah, the point, the, 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 there was a point... If there, are some, if there are some that are bad, then the whole thing's bad. Yes, the, the, the jackpot claim was intended to knock out every single yeah. itemisation in every registration, yes. yes. So that was the only challenge? That was the only challenge. And that, that's, that's gone. Even, even they accept that that's gone. Yeah. Now, so the bottom line, to be crystal clear on it, is I have two valid, incontested, uncontested now, never contested for validity, or, or apart from that, on that basis, <laughs> the first two registrations. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear about that. And the reason that matters is I'm about to show you in paragraph 30 of the judge's third judgment his interpretation of what the expression telecommunication services covers. And you will see, I believe and hope you will see, that I have two valid registrations with an extremely broad coverage for the purposes of infringement that is liable to make large amounts of the case coming on the other side, academic at best. Right, so with that digression... He goes on in paragraph 237 to refer to the early applications for registration being filed before this famous communication 4 slash 03. That, that is actually a non-point in its own way because um, communication 403, which uh, I'll give you for your note, it's authorities 3 tab 60, authorities 3 tab 60, it, it stated for the purpose of clarifying to the world at large what their existing practice was. It wasn't a new practice, it was a statement of their existing practice. The judge says, three or four lines down, I consider it's obvious that the reasons why Sky included long and detailed lists of goods and services was that by the dates those applications were filed, Sky's legal team appreciated there was a risk that the class headings covers all goods and services the approach articulated in Communication 403. The question had been much discussed before trademark lawyers in the UK, even before the appointed person made the reference in IP Translator. Actually, if, if, you, if you, in the privacy of your own rooms, were to look at Communication 403, it says explicitly that there is nothing wrong in using the class heading general terms and following it up with a whole long string of individual itemizations and the way these were structured. This is sheer surmise on the part of the judge and it doesn't fit with the dates. The point being that there was no reference in IP translation until the 27th of May 2010. The court didn't deliver judgment, the Grand Chamber, until 2012. And the latest of the cluster of five registrations resulted from applications for registration, the latest of them, filed in 2008. The idea that people, by doing this, were somehow or other anticipating their own failure in due course on a ruling from the Grand Chamber of the Court of Justice in 2012 is not a fair or available inference from the known facts. Now, moving on a little bit... Paragraph 240, the judge says, and I say correctly in the last sentence, that there's no adverse inference to be drawn against Sky in the absence of documents, which he's referred to in paragraph 40, noting, you'll see, that in the nature of things, that some of those documents will have been covered by pri privilege. He says no adverse inference in the last two sentences of 2.40. Nonetheless, the absence of such documents means it's necessary to look elsewhere for evidence as to Sky's intentions. Then he deals with the principal witness, Mr Tansey. Tansey told the court, and it's not controversial, 
in paragraph 241 that he took advice from the legal team. He had regular, approximately quarterly review meetings. He explained the position of Sky's IP legal team in 242 within the wider legal and business affairs department. In 243, he quotes exactly what Mr. Tanzi said. The Sky IP legal team were the legal experts on IP protection. It was their job to use their expertise when it came to the specifics. Accordingly, having taken on board upstream inputs from across the business, including from me, the Sky IP legal team took the lead, applying their expert judgment in preparing the detailed description of goods and services. Tansy's evidence at 244 was that EU 112 was filed at a time of particularly prolific expansion for Sky. Many of the goods and services covered by 992 and 604, but not 112, reflected products, initiatives and plans that he was involved in or aware of, and then the judge caveats that. He acknowledged, however, that he can't marry up every single article or service in the 2008 filings, or the 2006 filings, with a, with a Sky product or initiative from the filing date of the trademark initiative. And he refers it again back to the legal team. Now, at paragraph 245, the judge quotes, without adverse comment, what the witness had said. May I ask you please to read to yourselves paragraphs 35 to 37, which the judge quotes verbatim there. The, the judge does not say that he disbelieves the witness and to the contrary you'll note in paragraph 14 he records at the beginning of his judgment that counsel for Sky Kids admitted that Mr Tansy's evidence was untruthful this allegation was not put to Mr Tansy and in any event I don't accept it now as far as I can see that is evidence which stands which had to be taken into account on any bad faith assessment coming back in from the CJEU. What the judge did in 246, moving on, is to refer to the cross-examination, which related to sundry other things. And when I say other things, I mean things other than the selected goods or services, which provide the actual parameters for the claim for infringement and validity that fell to be determined in the final judgment. In this judgment, this main judgment, there never was what I called earlier an audit of those selected goods and services. There never was. And there wasn't in the second judgment either. The judge did not do it. Uh, the third judgment, forgive me, the judge did not do it there either. Now we have the discussion going down in those itemized um, sub numbers. You have the bleaching preparations, the animal skins, the motor vehicles, and so on and so forth. But not one of them touches or concerns the eight selected goods and services. And the judge then goes on, and remember we're shortly before he's making the order for reference. Can I take you to 250? 
you've, you've seen this translating through into the order for reference, 250. <coughs> the conclusion I draw from Tansy's evidence is that at the dates of applying for the trademark, Sky did not intend to use the trademarks in relation to all of the goods and services covered by the specifications. Sky were already using the trademarks in relation to some of the goods and services. Sky had concrete plans for using the trademarks in relation to some other goods and services. And Sky had a reasonable basis for supposing that they might wish to use the trademarks in the future in relation to some further goods. But the specifications include goods and services in respect of which Sky had no reasonable commercial rationale for seeking registration. And I've already addressed you on, on that and how it doesn't take you where the other side in this case wished to go. I'm forced to conclude that the reason for including such goods, key expression and services, was that Sky had a strategy of seeking very broad protection regardless of whether it was commercially justified. And the such refers back to the immediately antecedent sentence. 251, which was the basic cornerstone of his reference to the Court of Justice on Clarity and Precision, it's important to note that the specs include goods and services in relation to which I find that Sky had no intention to use the trademarks in three ways. First, the specifications included specific goods in relation to which I find that Sky, we should say, had no intention to use the trademarks at all. Examples of this are bleaching preparations and insulation materials and whips. Secondly, the specification included categories of goods and services that were so broad that Sky could not and did not intend to use the trademarks across the breadth of the category. The paradigm example of this is computer software, but there are others such as telecommunications, telecommunications services in all five marks. Thirdly, the specifications were intended to cover all of the goods and services in relevant classes, for example, class nine. I would add that I suspect that some of the specs covered whole classes in respect of which Sky had no intention to use, but since this was not put to Mr. Tansy, I made no finding on the point. 252 is important when you realize that the nature of the exercise when it comes back from Luxembourg is to do what the judge says is in 252 is leftover business. Counsel for Skykick submitted it was impossible to distinguish between the parts of the specs that covered goods and services in relation to which Sky intended to use the trademark and parts of the specs that covered goods and services in relation to which Sky had no such intention. I do not accept this. Drawing the line would be a labour intensive task, primarily because of the sheer length of the specs but I'm satisfied that in principle it would be possible. I do not propose to undertake the exercise at this stage, however, since the questions, questions of whether it's necessary to draw the line, and if so, the test to be applied, depends on the resolution of the legal issues discussed above. So my Lord, the, the judge himself is saying in the main judgment that there is more to be decided. It is patent on the face of the judgment that he did not deal with, and nor did the arguments, I can say, on the other side, deal with the eight specified goods and services. And when the matter comes back, I have what appears to be, in paragraph 245, three very clear paragraphs from the witness statement of Mr. Tanzi, which the judge describes as the core of his evidence, as to which, in relation to which, no aspersions are cast. What then happens? I come, finally, and I'm sorry it's taken so long. I come then to the third judgment, which is in this volume. Somewhere. 16. Tab 16. So, in, on page 
page three, stamped page 323, he quotes in paragraph 11 from the dispositive provisions of the CJEU judgment. So the explicit ruling is under 1, 2, and 3 at the end of the CJEU judgment. In paragraph 12, he notes that clarity and precision, it's clear from the CJEU's first ruling that the trademarks cannot be declared wholly or partly invalid on the lack of clarity or precision basis. And that's a common ground. With all that that entails, I add. Then he comes to the question of validity of the trademark's bad faith on stamped page 324. 13. Skykick accepts the trademarks can only be declared invalid in relation to those goods and or services in respect of which the court finds that the applications were made in bad faith and not totally invalid. Apart from that, there's a substantial dispute. Paragraph 14. In considering this dispute, it's necessary for me to start by acknowledging an important point which I appear partly to have <coughs> overlooked in the main judgment. This is that Skykick did not allege that the trademarks had been applied for in bad faith in relation to two of the selected goods and services, namely telecommunications services and electronic mail services. And then, my Lord, this is the point, in brackets is the point, my Lord, Lord Justice uh, uh, Sir Christopher Floyd put to me. Faced with this difficulty, Skykick sought permission in their submissions in reply to amend the case in relation to telecom communication services and electronic mail services. Unsurprisingly, it was opposed. Long story short, the judge refused permission. Far too late, can't do that now. You'd reopen a trial, no. Paragraph 17. The next question to address, and you'll notice at the end of 16, he says he's going to deal with this relatively briefly. At 17, the next question to address is whether Skykick has established that the trademarks were applied for in bad faith to any extent at all as ever there's, there's a dispute. In paragraph 18, he recites paragraphs 74 to 78, and we've been, I've been through those exhaustively with your lordships. He includes the paragraph relating to dishonesty. We had made the submissions relating to dishonesty, and the judge took no account of them in this judgment. In paragraph 19, the judge goes back to the main judgment. The key findings of fact in the main judgment were as follows. 250 and 251 I've just read to and with your lordship. And I say again, neither at that stage nor previously or now at this stage of the third judgment had Skykick or the court conducted the analysis mandated by the CJEU judgment in relation to the specified goods and services. It hadn't happened, and it isn't happening here now. Paragraph 20, he refers to the section 32.3 domestic declaration under the 1994 Act that only has any relevance in relation to the UK application for registration. And the point I've already made on that, which is essentially the point that comes out in the is you can only make a statement like that in paragraph 20 if you treat something in the specification of goods and services as a catalogue instead of just an indication of a type or kind. And we say it's wrong, certainly, in relation to the selected goods and services to even make a statement like that for the reasons which are essentially those which uh, found favour in Jaguar Land Rover. Paragraph 21, he refers back to what I've just shown your lordships in 251. And you'll notice I count five times, capital T, capital M, in my judgment, Sky applied for the trademarks. He's talking about the whole lot, the whole lot of all five. He is not talking about the selected goods and services at all. You see the deliberate strategy 
which is echoing what he'd said before, regardless of whether it was commercially justified. And then you get the sentence, about eight lines in. Sky thus applied for the trademarks, so he's, he's gone global, with the intention of obtaining an exclusive right for purposes other than those falling within the functions of the trademark. There is no discussion in this judgment or in the main judgment of what the functions of the trademark are, and we had pressed the judge extensively, and we've recycled, if I can put it that way, the submissions on functions into our appeal skeleton. You, you have got before you what we said to the judge about the functions of the trademark. And then he says, other than those falling within the function of the trademark, namely, purely, purely, as a legal weapon against third parties, whether in threats of infringement claims or actual infringement claims or oppositions to third party applications, as to which, and he's referring to those other proceedings, purely as a legal weapon. Well, Mr. Malinich can show you if there was ever a pleading if it was ever the part of any reference, order for reference to the Court of Justice on the bad faith part of the case, that we had applied purely as a legal weapon. And I pick up on the point which arises almost immediately. To describe a trademark registration or a patent, granted patent, or a registered design protection as a weapon is simply a pejorative way of referring to the fact that it's a registered right which gives you a registered property which gives you certain rights conferred by law. Yes, it's a weapon, I suppose, in that sense. But that isn't seemingly what the judge has got in mind here. He seems to be talking about it as though we have equipped ourselves with weapons. And please bear in mind that he is just about to go on to say that in relation to the eight selected goods and services, they are indeed categories of goods and services for which we have got use and for which we can retain registration. Purely as a legal weapon, I beg to submit not in relation to the eight selected goods and services on which he should have been concentrating, but didn't. Not at this point. He makes the same point again on the 32.3 declaration, and I've already made the point that I, in my submission that's not a fair way of looking at the statutory requirement for a, a declaration. He then says, 23, the next question is what should be done about the selected goods and services. I beg to submit to your Lordship that that was not the next question, that was the first question. And indeed, given the fact that the case had by agreement between the parties been circumscribed down to those eight selected goods and services, and I can show you Lordships that if I need to, that was the, really, that was the central, and I would say only question. My friends might differ, my learned friends might differ, but what, how is it that the judge is treating this, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, we don't think it's right with respect that the judge should be treating this as the next question down the line. It's the question. 24, so we're going down the itemizations now. This is the treatment of the itemization of the selected goods and services. It's convenient once again to start with computer software in class nine, to which I interpolate the judge had been referred to the judgment of the general court in chair entertainment, and it would have been appropriate for him to say, as we'd submitted and as we've submitted on this appeal, that the general court had decided in chair entertainment that computer software was not lacking in clarity and precision in the way which was thought to be so offensive in the first the order for reference on the first two questions. Computer software emerges on the case law of the court as unscathed in terms of all that overclaiming stuff. Given that I've concluded that Sky acted in bad faith in the second way identified in the main judgment at 251, the second way he'd identified in the main judgment at 251 was what we can conveniently call the Jaguar Land Rover way. He'd taken the view that my clients did not intend to use across the full breadth, the whole width. So he's treating computer software as a catalogue as opposed to an indication of type. 
and I've said more than once already, if my learned friends can show you any judicial support for that view in any case law in the European Union system, they're welcome to show you because I don't know of any. He says, it follows. In my respectful submission, it doesn't that the trademark should be declared invalid insofar as they're registered for computer software. Sorry. That's Sky Kids. Yes, that's Sky Kids. I apologise. I'm entitled to say it doesn't follow. It comes from my opponent. The judge correctly says, says counsel performing an immediate somersault, in my judgment this does not follow. The fact that Sky did not intend to use the trademarks across the breadth of this category of goods does not mean that they did not intend to use the marks in relation to any computer software. On the contrary, I made findings in the main judgment that Sky had actually used the trademarks in relation to some kind of its software. Okay, so we are absolutely within the territory of Jaguar Land Rover. In the alternative, Sky contend that the court should adopt a similar approach to that adopted in the context of revocation for non-use. And he cites the case in the Court of Appeal of Merck, KGA versus Merck Sharpe. In my judgment, however, there is a significant difference between the court's task in the two contexts. In the non-use context, the court's task is to devise a fair spec having regard to the use of the trademark during the relevant period which has been established by the proprietor on whom the a proprietor on whom the burden of proving use rests, and then note the antithesis. In this context, which is the bad faith context, the court's task is to determine the extent to which it's necessary to cut down the specification, having regard to the bad faith of the trademark proprietor, which has been established by the opposing party, and then these key words, on whom the burden of proving bad faith rests. To the extent that bad faith is not proved, then the specification must be left alone. So here we are. He's just accepted, or no, he's just established to his own satisfaction that it's not a non-use case. It's an invalidity for bad faith case. He correctly says that the burden of proof, a contra the non-use case, the burden of proof is on the person asserting bad faith, and to the extent that it's not pro proven, proved, then the specification must be left alone, and he's right. Now, at this point, what he should actually have said is, they haven't pleaded a bad faith case. He should actually have said that my side had asked him twice to require the other side to plead a proper case in the aftermath of the judgment of the CJEU. He hadn't asked them to do it, and they had not set out a case which could provide a basis for a judgment on bad faith according to those criteria. They had treated it just as question three for the order, of reference, order for reference envisaged as a non-use case. They had always made their case on the basis that no intention to use across the whole spectrum was bad faith. Now, they had a chance when we put forward our written submissions to actually mend and repair their position and put in a proper pleading, but they didn't. The judge then talks of an alternative argument in paragraph 26, computer software should be cut down. This is coming from Skykit. He says, rightly, in 27, we resist this. And then in the second, set, set, second line of 27, He's speaking of us. They haven't proposed any more limited specification of their own, even by way of a fallback position. In other words, that's not a fair criticism of us. We have the presumption of innocence. They have the burden of proof. They had put forward a case based on no intention to use. We had insisted as far as we possibly could that they should plead a proper case, and they hadn't done so. And for the judge to turn round and indicate that we had an opportunity to put forward a fallback position and assume the case against ourselves succeeded, I'm afraid I beg to submit, is not an appropriate understanding of the way the burden of proof and the way issues of this kind should be dealt with. 
And that before you factor in the usual requirements relating to proof of a case of dishonesty, and you know what my submissions are in that connection. 28. I consider that bad faith has been proved insofar as Sky applied to register the trademarks for computer software as part of their strategy without any commercial justification. Now, he says that, and you know where that comes from. It was the paragraph we dwelt on this morning. It's paragraph 77 of the judgment of the CJEU, which you'll find set out. So could you, could you put a finger in 328 and go back to 325 in this document? As we went through, what paragraph 77 said, without any intention to use, where there is no rationale for the application for registration, and then it said such bad faith may, however, be established only. The judge has stopped the quote. So in the sentence that bridges 327 up to the top of 328, he stopped the quote. He stopped any commercial justification, he does not focus on the only if aspect of paragraph 77. He goes on, the main problem with Skykick's proposed wording is that it explicitly, although Sky say inaccurately, based on my findings as to use which Sky have actually made of the trademarks. And no doubt for that reason, it's quite specific. And then he says this, which is pivotal. But it does not follow that Sky had no commercial justification for seeking protection wider than their actual use. On the contrary, it is well established that trademark proprietors have a legitimate interest in seeking protection in respect of goods or services in relation to which they may wish to use the trademark in question in future. Furthermore, as the non-cases show, and then he refers to the modest penumbra. What he's actually said, but it does not follow, is he's, what, he, what that actually means in the context of all of this is that the case which they advanced on the other side throughout is a case from which it does not follow that there's to be a finding of bad faith. This is the very point. It's between here and paragraph 30. It's between here and paragraph 30 in which the judge, in our respectful submission, should have stopped and said, I actually, they put forward a case for bad faith, which is based on non-use. They've, they've, they've sought narrower cut-down specifications on the basis of use, non-use. And the judge is saying, but it doesn't follow. It doesn't follow that because there's been use, non-use, that there's no commercial justification, which he's using as his litmus test. He makes what I've already described as an unfair um, comment in 29, again, in the absence of any alternative proposal from Sky. In our submission, no. He should have required a clear statement of case from my opponent. I must do the best I can to devise a specification which reflects the extent of the bad faith proof, but no more. This is the judge in adversarial proceedings stepping in and saying, they haven't done it because what they've talked about on use, non-use doesn't get them home. He should have stopped the case at that point. It's not the role of the judge in adversarial proceedings to step in and devise a specification which reflects the extent of the bad faith proof. And he makes his cut down on computer software. He goes through the same exercise. I flagged up earlier that paragraph 30 is important. Paragraph 30 has what you might call a protocol of interpretation in it. So looking at that, third line, I should explain that I consider that telephony, broadband, Wi-Fi, email, and instant messaging are all embraced by telecommunications. If we just hold that point, 
that means that the first two registrations, which are unassailable, they're not invalid, they're unassailable, have telecommunications in them. And on the judge's own protocol of interpretation, they include all of those things. On interpretation, they include them. That should be the end of the case on both validity and infringement with those two registrations alone. And when the judge says in the first two lines of 30, this wording could be said to be somewhat imprecise, but I have not been able to devise more precise wording. Would you spare a thought for the people who 10 years previously, 12 years previously, without all the case law, without the guidance of the Court of Justice, wrote what they did? And we now have a judge looking backwards down this end of the telescope saying, that he hasn't been able to devise more precise wording which gives Sky fair protection. That tells you that this is not a scientific task. It is actually a very difficult task, and, a, and it, it calls for a lot of judgment about what language to use. And bear in mind again that we're about to see, and we are seeing the process, and the eight selected goods and services, he's upholding them, save to an extent, which I'm going to show you, is exceedingly small. Right. So he goes on to 31, and I'm not going to weary you with the details on this, uh, because they come out in a moment or two. He goes down the eight selected goods and services, and I would ask you to consider, where is his reference point? What is it? What are the legal criteria that he's applying as to what a proper specification would have been as compared with the one that was written by the people who wrote it? Eight, ten, twelve years previously. Well, I suppose the um, the distinction between the specification that was written and the one the judge devised is is that the former does not tether the computer software to any particular purpose or sphere of activity. And so I understand the point yes. you're making about yes. about the way the case was formulated against you and and uh, proper proper notice and procedure and so on. There is more of the substance. But, uh, but there, is a, there is a distinction between computer software generally, which the reasons which Mr Justice Laddie gave is, there, is, is vast. There always is, and there um, always has been, and there ever more will be. And, and what's more, I've got the Court of Justice in chair entertainment saying it doesn't suffer from lack of clarity and precision. And as I've said repeatedly, there are specifications you could actually plaster the walls with them in, deci in decided cases in which no one turned a hair and they've enforced applications for registration with that wording in and they've enforced them against others. Nobody, but nobody, I beg to submit, I, I, well, I submit, and I, I, if they think they can demonstrate otherwise, I would like them to do so because I know of nobody in the EU system we operate, who's adhered to, other than Advocate General Sanchez, what Mr. Justice Arnold said. Mr. Justice, the learned judge absolutely believes that his position is the one that should be the case in relation to computer software. There, there's no doubt about it. None at all. And he's got the support of Mr. Justice Laddie from a 1938 Act statute. And he's got the support of the US Patent and Trademark Office. Well, but he hasn't. He hasn't actually got the support of anybody else, judicially, in the system that he's actually meant to be applied. And then you come to paragraph 34. The final question under this heading is what to do about the specification. You know, Lord, with, with the greatest respect, it wasn't the final question. It was the absolute threshold. Because he envisages a letter which was written. The letter was written by my side. They themselves, in correspondence, proposed that the question of validity should be confined to the eight selected goods and services. I'll give, I'll give you the note. I'll give you a reference to that. No, I won't. Yes, I will. Your note for that is a letter of the 27th of February, 2020, which is in Sky, Sky 2 at a tab. 
Mr. Roberts will have to call out. Page three, page three nine two in the in the bundle. They proposed it. The judge adopted, essentially adopted it here. We wrote the letter. It's not the final question. It's the it's it's the position that sets the parameters for the whole case. I mean, shouldn't the court, if the court's entirely satisfied, for example, that <coughs> that you should not have applied for uh, protection for bleaching preparations, um, and that that was done in bad faith? Um, why shouldn't the court go on to? deal with that even though it doesn't fall within your <coughs> cut down list of goods and services. Because he said he wasn't going to. He said he wasn't going to and I'm asking you should the court just stand by and say that's a question for another day if, if there's something on the register which is uh, which is a result of somebody's dishonesty. He actually said he will make no order if we wrote that letter. He'll make no order and he did make no order. I know you did, but... But that's the end of it. Is that the right approach for the court to take? Yes, there's a case called Adobe Systems, which mm. he refers to... Is he, does he refer to it in this judgment? I think yes, he does. Mm. Mm. Is that, is that the case when the, when the court is conscious of... Well, the logical consequence of the court's decision is, is that something's on the register as a result of um, bad faith. Bad faith in relation to, I ask, without being impertinent, what? say, bleaching preparations. Well, and that, my lord, with the greatest respect, that shouldn't make any difference at all when the parties agreed position, their common ground, which the judge accepts, is that the trial on this question mm -hmm. of validity and infringement is on eight selected goods and services of which bleaching preparations are one. Otherwise, we can't end up in a situation in which, to, to borrow the words of the Victorian judge on unclean hands, will end up with equity requiring suitors to have led blameless lives. Mm. This, is, this isn't, with the greatest respect, this, this isn't uh, any way to conduct a trial on any specified goods and services. You say that once the parties had agreed to limit the scope of the action to, to the specified goods and services, then there was no, nothing the court needed to say about the... Uh, in fact, things have got onto the register as a result of bad faith. Yes. yes it's it? a, it's a it's, first of all, you need to bear in mind that it went into the trial on the eight specified mm. goods and services in the first place. It went out to Luxembourg on the eight specified goods and services, and it came back to London on the eight specified goods and services. And there was the letter, which I was trying to call out, which I did call out the reference to, where they proposed that it be limited, what they proposed was that the remainder of the claim be stayed, and the judge said, no, I'm going to make no order on it, and he formally made no order. If, That's you, what read, if you made no order, why, why are we spending time worrying about this point? <laughs> what are you appealing against? I'm... Well, my Lord, I, I hesitate to interrupt my little friend. That's not, not exactly a, a, an accurate um, representation of the proceedings. In fact, the counterclaim was in full force and effect. Can you get the letter? Throughout the ECJ judgment and afterwards. And it was, in fact, only uh, at the, before the third judgment that Sky was offered the chance to withdraw reliance on the other goods and services, finally. So mm -hmm. what went to the ECJ was a full consideration of the entire policy of Sky in relation but, to the entire market. But what, what happened is, is you had a counterclaim, Mr. Malamit. Yes. Which extended as far as bleaching pr preparation. Yes. And that's, that, as I understand it, at some point you agreed not to pursue that. No, what, what, what happened was we thought that the, there were two options once the ECJ judgment had been delivered. Uh, and they were, either the judge was going to go through our existing counterclaim, uh, or he was going to, and that would have taken an incredibly long time. I, mean, I haven't showed you the trademarks yet. You probably need to look, look at those at some point. Uh, because the, uh, th th that's an important point. But the, the, the two options were either he were to do that or we said, well, why don't we stay those and they can go off to, to be dealt with by the IPO separately. But they're very much still in play. ECJ was concerned, and so was the Advocate General and the judge when it came back to him, with the 
full sweep of bad faith that had been applied for, uh, marks that had been applied for in bad faith for all of the goods and services that were an issue, uh, one by one, so to speak. Uh, right. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm asked to just read out from the fourth judgment, paragraph three. Um, by letter dated 30th of April, Sky uh, 2020, Sky formally withdrew their infringement claim, save insofar it was based on the selected goods yes, and services. Yes. That's well after the, uh, all of this. Uh, and, and until that point, uh, it had them uh, formally in place. I should also say that it, <laughs> there is no requirement for us to withdraw those in relation to the UK mark. We could have continued the counterclaim in relation to the UK mark, the case that uh, my learned friend is referring to, the Adobe case. So, uh, but in the interest of procedural economy, we weren't going to spend time and effort uh, attacking uh, goods and services that weren't being alleged against us at this point. Uh, but I just wanted to correct that. Well, I, I'm very sorry, but I don't accept that account that's just been given to you, and I need to show you two documents, and I'm sorry to stress this on your patience. Would you take Sky 2 of 2? And turn to page 392. You have the heading which goods or services are in issue. Shortly before trial, your client, Sky, identified its purported best goods and services which formed the focus of the trial and on which, in respect of which it was accepted that if it couldn't win on those, it couldn't do better on others. It was never formally withdrawn reliance on any other goods and services against our client. We propose that your client now confirms that it does not rely on any other goods and services beyond those referred to in 297 of the main judgment. These goods and services are, and they itemise them correctly, and then it says, assuming your court provides such confirmation, the court can confine its consideration in these proceedings of the bad faith invalidity counterclaim to those goods and services. Our client would be willing to stay the bad faith counterclaim against the remainder of the goods and services in these proceedings and transfer those questions to the UK IPO or EU IPO for determination. We gave the confirmation. The judge knew that we were um, saying that we'd confined our case. The judge wanted it formalised. That's the paragraph we had open. And the effect of that is that the only aspect of it which wasn't a referral to the UK IPO or EU IPO, the judge made no order on the remainder. The second, so that's the position. It was agreed. The, the, the date of the confirmation, if my learned friend could just clarify when the confirmation was given to the court. Does it matter? It does matter because the, the final judgment proceeded on all the goods and services, except that at the hearing, my learned friend, as I recall, it was either in the skeleton or at the hearing, for the first time withdrew them. No, this hearing took place on paper. The judge gave this statement here, write a letter within seven days. We wrote a letter within seven days, and the whole thing was confined. I'm, I'm not even going to go back to the other document. We, we had said in pleadings, in formal terms, before the trial, that we were confining our case to those eight, eight, eight selected goods and services, our case. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, but I lost it. My Lord, Lord Justice and Luigi asked me a question about what's the point of that I'm trying well, to... Why, why are we looking at this? Since, since it, as I understand it, the judge didn't make any order in relation to anything else. He didn't. So there's nothing for you to appeal in relation no, to anything I, else. I, I, so, I, so what is the... I, why, why are we concerned I, with, with paragraph 34? That was the question. Okay, thank you. Okay. Paragraph, I, I, my submission was that actually it's not the first, it's not the final question, it's the first question, because you need to know when you're coming back what the parameters are of what it is you're trying. I've called it several times the audit on the eight selected goods and services. The judge was in fact meant to be coming to a finding of bad faith, yea or nay, in relation to those selected goods or services. What he does is he turns to them as the next question as he calls it in paragraph 23, he works his way through them and he comes up with a specification which he's cut down for, for the ones which he's going to cut down. My point is that everything that precedes that 
is all about all the generality. I said that I counted five times in paragraph 21 the reference to trademarks, meaning all and every aspect of all of them. And yet those aren't what was in issue that needed to be determined. It was the selected goods and services. So all I'm saying is, no, not all I'm saying, what I'm saying is that the judge had or should have delivered a judgment on the eight selected goods and services, and it should have covered the ground. What was alleged? What was what, did, what was proven in fact? How does that satisfy the criteria of the Court of Justice? And what then follows in terms of cutting down? Is the, so the Jaguar Land Rover endpoint, what is it you say? What is it you say the specification should be? Now, all they do is continue to run a non-use case. And the judge says, when you get to a roundabout, yeah, there it is now, paragraph 24, bridging into 25, that's not, that's not what bad faith is about. And he's right. He's saying correctly that bad faith is not synonymous with non-use. Where's the rest of it? He doesn't put them to any requirement to plead and prove the extras. As I said to you, my, my position is that whilst absence of use may be indicative of symptomatic, it isn't itself bad faith, indicative of symptomatic. Where's the rest of it? They didn't put anything forward. We asked them to, they didn't. The judge didn't make them do it. And then he goes and he adopts the approach, which we say is quite wrong for an English judge in adversarial proceedings in 29, in the absence of any alternative proposal from Scott, I must do my best to devise a specification. There's obviously a procedural point to all there concerned is. with. Um, and then beyond, beyond the procedural point, there's a substantive point. There is, and, and I need to make that now by reference yes. to the schedule to my skeleton. Would, would it be just before you go there, my lord? Um, before the judge gets on to consider the specifics of selected goods and services, other than the two which aren't challenged. Yes. Uh, in twenty one, he's set out why he says that you acted in bad faith, uh, and he gets his punch sentence at the end. Um, you applied for the trademarks with the intention of obtaining an exclusive right for purposes other than those falling within the functions of a trademark. Um, so there he's presumably tracking the Court of Justice. He is. Um, is it that you say he is wrong in concluding uh, that you uh, applied with the intention of um, obtaining the right other than uh, for those purposes? Uh, uh, or is it that you say that of itself doesn't take him far enough? I say both of those things, but I want to get, just draw your attention to the context of 21. Yeah. Okay, so tw 21 is really all we've got. Yeah. To what, for what then follows. Yes. So let's, may, I, may I do it slowly with you? Applied for the trademark partly in bad faith in each of three ways. And we looked at that. In each of those three ways, you'll remember that the judge says, in some instances this, in some instances that, and in other instances such and such. He never localised any of those comments in relation to the eight selected goods and services. He could have been, and probably was, talking about anything, all and sundry, and some were good and some were bad. So he's already delivered a curate's egg judgment good in parts, bad in parts. He's already said that, and he's using that platform to come to a decision which is going to be directed to the eight selected goods and services. Now, it doesn't take you anywhere in my respectful submission to say I've already made a judgment that says it's curate's egg, good in bad, good in parts. In each of these places, in paragraph 21, where it refer refers to things like some goods and services, third line, fifth line, such goods and services, it takes you nowhere. 
because it's not directed to the eight selected goods and services, and he doesn't close the gap. I'm probably muddling everybody, but suppose he intends this to apply across the board, including in relation to the selected goods and services. So suppose that this were directed at those rather than the wider group. Um, where, where do you say the, the reasoning breaks down? He couldn't have said that because when you go back to the judgment, his main judgment, which he treats as the platform, he himself says, I have not completed this exercise. Do you remember the paragraph? I, I, I do remember that. Yes, but I have not completed the exercise. And I've just made general statements about some here, some there, and some other. Yes. I mean, it may be that I am just muddling everybody, no, including myself. No, no, I'm very but, anxious um, that my Lord should press me on it. So he, he, he has explained that he's referred back to paragraph 251 of the main judgment, saying um, that in various respects you applied for marks for things you going beyond what you intended to use. And then he says Sky thus applied with the intention of, of obtaining an exclusive right for purposes other than those falling within the functions of a trade right. Well, for ev if he's saying that for everything, then he hasn't laid any basis for it in the main judgment. He can't, by referring back to the main judgment, treating it as, as, as a basis that's been laid there. He's not taken any account of Tansy's evidence at all, which he appears to have accepted by quoting it in full without qualification or comment. And it's simply not a statement that he could make from beginning to end in every nth degree in relation to all of the trademarks as he's making, as he's making it in paragraph 21. He ne there's a gap. If he wants to say, as I was saying in my main judgment, and to recapitulate on that, he has to close the gap between the trademarks and all of them and the eight selected goods and services. And from where I'm standing and in my respectful submission, it doesn't happen. Do you not go beyond that? I mean, if the hypothesis is you didn't intend to use some of the things encompassed in the Indeed. Uh, category, um, you would say that thus isn't warranted, wouldn't you? Because it, you would say it doesn't follow from the fact that you didn't intend to use some of it, uh, yes. that uh, you were applying with the intention of obtaining an exclusive right for purposes other than those falling within the functions of a trademark. Yes, yes. Indeed, I do, and, and and let me be rude, but in, 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 just to make the point in crisp terms, let it be found that I didn't, in some cases, intend to use. My answer is, and so what, and what of that? So that so it is the case you challenge the thus. You say that what what has come before doesn't warrant that next bit. I, I do, but I mean I'm. Writing judgments, reading judgments, words like thus and therefore do right. creep in. I, I don't want to hang anything on, on the question of a single word. But in the context in which this is said, uh, my point is, this is all we've got and it doesn't do the job. Can I, can I just take it one stage further? So then the judge goes on to explain. He says that you, you were applying with the intention of using the right as a legal weapon. But plainly, if you get the right, it is a legal weapon. I think the law intends it. And the law intends it. Um, so of itself, the mere fact that you want a legal weapon doesn't seem to mean that you want it for a purpose other than the function of a trademark. And the word that I pick on there is the word purely, because the judge is making the word purely do something by way of adjudicative work. It, so what is it that, as we've made the point in our skeleton, I got. I end up with, and I end up with a perfectly acceptable legal weapon, which is the one he leaves me with. But before that, I had something which was purely a legal weapon, which was unacceptable. And the question is, what are the legal criteria for the purposes? What what he loaded into the word purely by way of legal criteria here? And, and they can't be anywhere, they, they can't be any legal criteria other than those which are found in the CJEU judgment. 
He recites the paragraphs, but as I've already pointed out, on, on the one which he pick, picks on as a basis, he doesn't complete the quote from the paragraph 77, on which we had a discussion this morning. I'm going so now I am I am going to just about close this point off when I go to the schedule to my skeleton, please. Now you may have it loose, but if you, if you don't, it's tab four of the core bundle. has done is he's saying now, he's writing now what he thinks our clients, my clients ought to have written way back when so we're now talking backwards through time the dates are 2003 for two of them, 2006 for one of them and 2008 for the last two now the, those are the key dates, and everything for bad faith is at the date as at the date of filing. He doesn't actually pause at any point to consider the position in relation to the filing date of any of the applications for registration. He deals with them all on a blanket basis. They were all filed before the IP translator judgment, which is not retroactive and can't be used against them anyway. But put that on one side. He's envisaging bad faith on the part of a person sitting somewhere, let it be an office, for the purpose of working on this. And that person, according to the case law, is someone who is not required to indicate or even to know precisely the use that he or she will make of the mark applied for, CJEU paragraph 76. That person is not required to have any economic activity corresponding to the goods and services referred to, CJEU para 78. That person is a person to whom, of whom and in relation to whom the case law says that computer software, that phrase, does not lack clarity and precision. And the CJEU has ruled in paragraph 65 to 67 that lack of clarity and precision is in any event, even if it suffers from it, not contrary to public policy. The CITEC case, for whose, which, which exists for the benefit of the person we're hypothesizing here, and the later cases, including Jaguar and Land Rover, stand for the proposition that the width, the breadth, the size, the size is the word they use, the size of the list of goods and services is not to be taken as, it, as being in itself a basis for bad faith. Okay? And the functions for which a trademark can be, trademark protection can be sought, are broad. And these are marks which are in the hands of a very, very large organisation with very widely dispersed activities, and they wanted, according to Tansy, whose evidence doesn't appear to be contradicted or doubted, who isn't contradicted and doesn't appear to be doubted, who's explained how, how they worked, basically what they, doing what they saw as in their own best interest. I ask your Lordships to consider how is the judge able to say that the persons we're hypothesizing, working within those parameters, framed those specifications down the left-hand column in bad faith? How? There is only one answer that I can supply, which is that the judge was, I'm afraid, determined at the end of this exercise which has been long and drawn out, was determined that there should be some rule or some legal basis upon which to cut down broad words which he didn't like, such as computer software. And he's himself said, and it is in any event the case, that non-use 
or an absence of intention to use is not of itself bad faith either. Now what we've done in the right hand column is to identify to your lordships with inserting those words in italics come from paragraph 30 of the third judgment which is the judge's interpretation of telecommunications. We've interpolated those words into the specification that he left us with. So apparently despite everything I've just said about the latitude parameters and so on within which the draftsman of the specification is working and the tolerance is allowed to him, that person has engaged in bad faith to the extent of the increment, to the extent of the increment between the left hand column and the right hand column. So the hypothesis is that somebody was engaged in an exercise in verbal engineering to the extent of producing a bad faith specification to the extent of that increment, but at the lower extent was working within good faith parameters. Now, did any human being ever operate in that way? This is, this is a legal construct. This is a legal superimposition of a standard that the judge is imposing retrospectively on the draftsman all those years ago. There's no human being that, that could have worked in the way presupposed by this specification we end up with. And then please look with me at the smallness of the increment in question. So you've got computer software at large, item one, and you've got computer software supplied from the internet, item two, and the judge adopted the same cut down spec for both. All right. So read through the first line and a half for the semicolon and then read on. Computer software supplied as part of or in connection with any telecommunications with the enlarged definition apparatus or service. So computer software supplied as part of or in connection with any telecommunications service. Application software for accessing audio, visual, and audiovisual content via mobile telephones and or te tablet computers. We have been left with a broad specification, even at the hands of a judge who was not sympathetic to computer software being protected on a broad basis. And yet we have He's allowed us and left us with broad coverage, any telecommunications service. Same applies when you look at three, left-hand column versus right-hand column. Computer software and telecoms apparatus, pass over that. Third line, computer software to enable connection to the internet. Data storage, he doesn't like data storage, cuts it down to audio visual and or audio visual content and documents. If documents is given the meaning that we normally attribute to it, say it was a disclosure exercise in this court, there's scarcely any difference between data storage in the left hand column and storage of documents in the right hand column. Have I understood number three correctly? That, uh we start with computer software and telecoms apparatus to enable connection to databases and the internet. Yes. And he says cut out data, cut out databases. No, but, but, they're, but they're there in, uh, no, in he databases hasn't cut it out. and the internet are both still there. No, he hasn't cut it out. So if, if you look with me at three on the right hand, right hand cell, computer software and telecoms, in the italics show you his protocol on interpretation reading apparatus to enable connection to databases and the, ju the judge has added of audio visual and or audio visual content and documents yeah. and that tracks his qualification that you yes. put on for you see but my, my point is broad broader than that what is the point of substituting for data storage storage of etc etc 
document? What is the point? And what is the theory which says that the draftsman who wrote data storage was a bad person in terms of bad faith, but would have, was a, would have been and an is a good person once you cut down data storage to storage of documents? Where it, there's no such person. This is this is not dealing with real human beings in the real world. Item five is telecommunications, left untouched. They didn't, for the reasons you know, telecommunications isn't touched. Electronic mail services not touched. Internet portal services. Judge says I'm not going to touch that. So the, the draftsman was okay, not a bad person for bad faith purposes when he wrote internet portal services. And then number eight, computer services for accessing and retrieving information slash data via a computer or computer network gets cut down to computer services for accessing and retrieving, then the interpolation audio, visual and or audio visual content and documents, and then the judge carries on via a computer or computer network. Whoever this person or team of persons were would have had a very peculiar mindset in order to be arriving. And remember the intention requirement and the dishonesty requirement and all the rest of it. To have been arriving at something which was bad in the left-hand column but okay and good in the right-hand column. It's unreal. It's unreal. And the reason it's in this form is because the judge did the work. They did not do the work. They did not plead out the case on the selected goods and services. They put forward a non-use case. Judge says not good enough. Judge never required them, never required them to plead out a proper case. You know the argument on that. And by the way, if he had, if he had required them to do it, his judgment would have been better and properly structured. But it wasn't. He didn't require them to do it. And so he stepped in and done it for them. And it was always going to end up here. It's a sad story. It's always going to end up here because the judge was convinced that you shouldn't be able to have, keep going back to it, computer software. He was convinced that under this legislation you shouldn't have it any more than Mr. Justice Laddie didn't like it under the 1938 It was always going to end up here. And that's my case on the validity appeal. Now, I switch to infringement and I switch over to my learned friend, Mr. Roberts, to address you in relation to. That will give you some welcome relief, maybe, from my, my voice. Um, I just want to make a couple of legal points at this stage. And, and I'm saying this because we have a respondent's notice to the other side's appeal. And we've got timetabling for us to deal with the respondents' notice. And in that respondents' notice, there are plenty of points which I might otherwise have raised now, but which they know are coming, and which I'm, I think it would be appropriate to raise then. Now, there are a couple of issues that I want to touch on by way of general introduction. There is a discussion in the skeletons about class numbers and classification. And it runs through a case called Altechnic. It's known as the CareMix case. And it runs into a lengthy judgment produced by the late Justice Henry Carr. Which case was that? Pathfinder IP. Pathfinder IP. The first, first one in chapter two. Very lengthy judgment. And where I'm standing, and Mr. Malinich can tell you what it's all about, I don't for the life of me understand what the free occupation is. Um, a bit of history. The House of Lords gave permission to appeal from the Court of Appeal in our technique. And counsel instructed Simon Thorley, Mr. Manuel Michaels, Richard Arnold, Mr. Ian Purvis, and I was instructed to lead Daniel Alexander. And it's settled. 
two days or a day before it was due to come into the House of Lords. And you, you won't necessarily have seen it, although there are glimpses of it here. Mr Justice Arnold has a number of times in judgments at first instance raised the question rhetorically as to whether Altec was correctly decided. Uh, well, bold, first instance judge, uh, as to whether the Court of Appeal decided the case correctly or not, that's bold. But they're making, they're making such a meal of this and I can't for the life of me see why. The point is very simple. If you treat, and logically you would, the class number as um, a guide to the interpretation of the language of the wording of the specification. So, for example, to take the care mix case, they filed for registration of the marked care, fix, care mix for valves in class 7. Now, valves do fall into class 7. So, on the face of it, it was a perfectly regular filing. But they suddenly said, oops, we meant valves in class 11. So change, just, just change the number of the class and put my application with all the same details, the same filing date and everything. Put me in class 11. And so the registrar said, yeah, OK. Then there was a challenge to that. The registrar reversed his position, went to Mr Justice Laddie. Mr Justice Laddie reversed the registrar, went to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal reversed Mr Justice Laddie. And there we are. But it doesn't matter for it's got, it's got the price of eggs for, for the purposes of this appeal. Because if the class number is used to interpret the nature of the goods, it doesn't alter the fact that Section 60A of the Act and all sorts of antecedent case law establishes but doesn't prevent you from making a finding that goods or services are identical or similar, even though they might otherwise be classifiable in another class. The only time that the class number will produce a real problem, and I can't at the moment think of a case in which it's ever happened, is when there's a contradiction. So when metaphorically you have somebody who's made an application to put a cow in a sheep enclosure. So let, let class 7 be your sheep enclosure, and they've made an application to put something which is described classifiable metaphorically as a cow and they want to put it in a sheep enclosure then you'll have a contradiction now what are you going to do are you going to deem it to be a sheep I don't think so are you going to say it's an entirely non-effective designation you might or on the other hand you might adopt a judicial approach which says people in this world make mistakes and subject to curing it by some appropriate mechanism I'll look and see if there is one but I, I only dwell on that in passing simply because the point, the point of what's happening here, the class numbers have got nothing to do with the price of eggs in this case. So I mention it in order to say. Well, that we'll see how the argument, one of the arguments is that telecommunications as a class heading means communicating, communicating from A to B. <clears throat> I send an email to you, that's telecommunications. It's not... Uh, it's not things outside that, so you give it a narrow interpretation. And when you come to read the alphabetical list of services or whatever list of services the applicant's got in his registration, you construe it with that in mind. Now you say, I don't know what you say, but you, you, you say that may not be a very satisfactory guide to... No, you don't, you don't. And you're told now by Section 60, right, uh, Section 60, capital letter A of the 1994 Act, that the class number and the classification has got nothing to do with whether the goods are similar or different when you come to make a challenge. You can't make the administrative process of the class numbers and the classification do that work. Well, similar or different, something slightly... There's an exercise in construction of those trademark applications. Mm. Oddly, it's very rarely referred to as that, but it's a question of construction. And you have a class heading, which could be seen as the envelope, and then you have uh, a list of things which are supposed to fall within the envelope. And if you have an ambiguity as to whether something falls within the envelope or doesn't, the class heading may help you to decide that uh, which that falls on. In, in reality, not so. It just doesn't happen that way. In reality, what happens is the, the rule now is that you interpret the words mean what they say. 
you don't you don't treat the class heading as being some form of coded message as to all the things that are subtended by the word. I've already shown you paragraph 30 of the judge's third judgment in which he says explicitly what telecommunication services means. He already says it includes email services, and it includes other things as well, broadband, etc., etc., etc. The only question is whether the goods in issue are identical or similar to the purposes of the infringement claim. That's the only question. Now, if you're going to, all that happens is you may move the boundary of the question of whether they're identical, leaving you with the question of whether they're similar. But that's the discussion I had with my lord this morning on legal services, barristers, wills, um, uh, pensions practice, and uh, intellectual property practice. There are, all it does is it, it, it removes to another part of the case the question of whether there's identity or similarity. That's all. But you well, don't. Be the correct approach. Um, words mean I, what I, they say. The, the, the instruction, the, 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 the legislation says words mean what they say. Natural and ordinary meaning mm -hmm. of the words. It's, it's now. It, 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 that's now a settled point. There's no code. There's no coded message. The words mean what they say. Natural and ordinary meaning of the words. That, that's where we are. Um, there's another point um, which I just wanted to flag up. There's a theory which is being advanced about how you test for similarity under the canon case. They've cited canon paragraph 22, which is always cited for this purpose, which seems to say you need evidence to establish similarity between goods and services, even if the marks are identical. Well, no. And the reason is because there is no default position which says that goods are dissimilar or not similar in the absence of evidence to prove that they are. There's no default position. The rule, as with all cases involving the burden of proof or evidential burdens, is you look at the material that's in front of you and you decide the case. There's no shortage of material in front of the judge in this case. And, and, and the, the, the statements which are made by reference to Canon Paragraph 22, they were recycled by the CJEU into a case called Alakan San, which is, we've noted all this in our skeleton, and then my learned friend, Mr. Malinich, ran this argument, which he's running here on the need to adduce evidence. He ran it in a case called Ineos, and they rejected it. The general court rejected it explicitly. It's not an argument which is available to be run. You decide the case on the material before you. There's no burden either way. You look at what's there, and you decide. And actually, in many of these cases, in this country, in the registry level, and around Europe, you take the decision by looking at the words in the one and the words in the registration, so the application and the registration or whichever way round they are, and you look. And if there's no evidence, as, as, as in nine times out of ten cases there won't be, you make up your mind using what every tribunal is pleased to call its common sense. There's no burden of proof, evidential burdens, and all the rest of it. It just doesn't apply. You've, you've had the, you, you've got our skeletons and, and on infringement, and you've got our skeletons on passing off. You know what we're saying. Um, I've got to give way to my learned friend, Mr. Roberts, who's, who's um, been deprived of oxygen and air time for too long by me now. Do you mind if I sit down and um, share the burden with him? Mr. Roberts. <coughs> My lords, I shall uh, endeavour to uh, condense um, some of what I had uh, proposed to say. Um, I was proposing to uh, address your lordships uh, on in four areas. First of all, to uh, outline the judge's findings of infringements and how they flow from the main judgment through the third and the fourth judgments. Uh, secondly, to deal with the point that's raised in the reply skeleton uh, of Skykick, that uh, somehow Sky is confined or constrained in this appeal to arguing identity of services and uh, not similarity. Uh, it, it said that there's no proper basis, uh, that, that we are shut out. The third area um, which I think is where the most um, compression is going to have to occur, is in relation to the evidence as to the defendant's products. 
uh, and then fourthly, uh, how we say that reads onto uh, the schedule that my learned friend Mr. Hobbs has spent some time with, that, that uh, landscape uh, table at the back end of our uh, appeal skeleton. Uh, so my lords, um, all of those submissions are located within ground five of our grounds of appeal. It's the um, findings of infringement uh, that were made and that we say should have been made uh, on a broader basis than uh, were made by uh, the learned judge below. And of course, all of the infringement submissions depend rather on what your lordships uh, determine about validity, because of course, until we know what is uh, validly registered. So there are a whole load of permutations and combinations about what uh, might be uh, resolved by this court. Skykick say that uh, the learned judge should have knocked out all eight, uh, no, uh, five or six of the eight uh, selected goods and services, um, or perhaps uh, done a more uh, extensive job of narrowing them down, that's their fallback case. And as uh, for the reasons that my learned friend Mr. Hobbs has addressed uh, your lordships on, uh, Sky say that in fact the, the left-hand column of that table uh, should have been left untouched. That we should ha uh, that Sky should have uh, the eight selected goods and services uh, with no um, partial invalidation in relation to bad faith. And uh, I propose to uh, address your lordship solely in relation to um, the original effectively the left hand and the right hand column uh, in that table because the uh, what would happen in the event that uh, my learned friend Mr. Malinich and Skykick make inroads into validity and bad faith it is properly a subject for the respondent's notice uh, and the reply. So first of all the findings of infringement and um, this is dealt with in the, the main judgment uh, between paragraphs 291 and uh, 303. Um, the pivotal paragraph in my submission uh, on the comparison of goods and services is 297 of the main judgment. And uh, if your lordship still have the, um, the table of selected goods and services uh, at the end of our skeleton, that might be a useful uh, ready reckoner uh, for what was actually found. the final page in tab 4. At 297 of the main judgment, the learned judge found that, and this of course is the, the pre-CJEU judgment, found that Skykick provide goods identical to selected goods and services 1 to 3. So that's the computer software uh, goods listed in the uh, at items one, two, and three. That Skykick provide services similar to number four, data storage. The learned judge said that there, was a, there were questions of interpretation as to whether there was identity or similarity in relation to item five and item seven. So that's telecoms and internet portal services. He said that those questions of interpretation engaged the clarity and precision objection. And finally, he, uh, the learned judge held that Skykick provides services identical to number six and number eight. So electronic mail services and computer services for accessing and retrieving information slash data via a computer or computer network. And of course, at that stage, the judge was only dealing with the left-hand column because he hadn't uh, carried out the trimming exercise that uh, his lordship did in the third judgment. And in my submission, those conclusion, the conclusions that are reached in the third and the fourth judgment on infringement arise out of paragraph 297 uh, of the main judgment. Uh, and in particular, his findings uh, of infringement in relation to electronic mail services item six, that was the infringement found in the third judgment. And then um, item number eight of the selected goods and services, that was in the uh, fourth judgment. So the, 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 the parting shot uh, before we went off to Luxembourg was paragraph 303 of the main judgment, where the judge said that if the marks are validly registered, uh, they are infringed. But the whole question of validity was referred off 
uh, to Luxembourg. Then coming back from the CJU, at paragraph 39 of the third judgment, uh, we find the, the finding, the conclusion, that cloud migration, one of the two products, uh, in, in, two main products in issue, uh, infringed at least in relation to email services. And uh, we see from paragraph 39 and paragraph 42 uh, of the third judgment that the learned judge considered that that was sufficient, that was determinative, as he put it, um, of the claim for infringement, as he uh, considered it at the time. Um, there is, as my learned friend Mr. Hobbs uh, has drawn to your Lordship's attention, um, quite a lot of the judgment concerned with telecommunication services. Uh, so paragraph, for your Lordship's note, paragraph 15, um, he says that in the case of telecommunication services, it wouldn't assist Skykick, even if they were successful in cutting down the scope of this term. And, and he says that's for reasons which will appear. Those reasons appear in paragraphs 30, which my learned friend Mr. Hobbs has taken you to, where he says that telephony, broadband, Wi-Fi, and instant messaging are all embraced by telecommunications. Paragraph 43, and then really through to 60. I mean, that's all about uh, the construction of telecommunication services. Uh, and in particular, at paragraphs 58 to 60, uh, where the judge, the learned judge concludes, telecommunication services include services consisting or relating to email, but he says it's not necessary to reach a conclusion on the rest uh, because the, the other uh, selected goods and services are, in his words, weaker. Uh, and paragraph 61, again, weaker, therefore not necessary uh, to consider. So the learned judge, in, in my submission in the third judgment, was saying, well, one of the products, namely cloud migration, infringes in, in relation to at least email services, and therefore that's determinative of the infringement claim. As your lordships may have seen from the fourth judgment, uh, there arose a dispute about um, what at least meant. Uh, and I hope I'm not putting it too unfairly when I say my learned friends uh, on the other side of the court construed at least as at most uh, and said that there'd only been a finding of infringement in relation to one of their two products and then only in relation to one of the services. Uh, so that's dealt within the fourth judgment, paragraphs four to eight. And uh, the learned judge below took the view, well, concluded that cloud backup infringed selected goods and services uh, number eight. So that's as cut down computer services for accessing and retrieving audiovisual and or audiovisual content and documents via a computer or computer network. So the approach of the learned judge in my submission was to find the, 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 what he considered to be the high watermark in relation to uh, the two main products, cloud migration and cloud backup, so there's been infringement, and therefore it's not necessary to consider uh, the other uh, matters. We do say, however, as my learned friend Mr. Hobbs uh, has outlined, uh, that there is a finding in Sky's favour in relation to telecommunication services because of the way the judge says, in effect, it, it adds nothing because it embraces email services. We say that's tantamount to a conclusion uh, that telecommunication services uh, embrace and subsume electronic mail services and that therefore there is a uh, finding in relation to infringement uh, under that basis too uh, in relation to the cloud migration product. So my lords that's what we say are, is the position in relation to uh, the findings of infringement have been made. We say there are no findings of non-infringement. Um, there are merely non-findings of infringement in relation to the other matters uh, which were below the waterline. And we say that the judge, uh, we were then um, criticised to a certain extent in the cost judgment, in the, at the end of the fourth judgment, uh, for, because we should have only pleaded the high water marks and the rest was unnecessary. Well, we say that uh, the learned judge could and should have gone on to find infringement in relation to uh, the other goods and services and we say that that works in relation to identity and similarity. 
Uh, that brings me on to the second point, uh, the second topic, which is um, the contentions of Skykick uh, mm -hmm. that Sky is somehow confined to running an identity infringement case in this court and not similarity. This is um, paragraph 9 of the Skykick appeal reply skeleton and paragraphs 22, 21 to 29 um, of their skeleton. Before we, go, before we go on to that, yes, why do you need more findings of infringement? You've, got, you've caught the cloud backup and you've caught the cloud migration with your email services um, and you say probably telecommunication services as well. So, I don't really understand the point that you might you know, want to collect some more findings. But what, what good commercially is that going to do to Sky? It's not just to add them to our stamp collection, my lord. It, it, it's that um, we've already had the issues that we experienced between the third and the fourth judgment with a, a degree of, um, how shall I put it, optimism by Skykick about uh, anything that's not explicitly held to infringe uh, must mean non-infringement. Uh, and it arose, in relation to, it arose in the context of the form of order. Because on the form of order, uh, as your lordships may have seen, the, uh, the Skykick were saying that the injunction, if it were uh, ordered at all, should just be in relation to the product and just be in relation to those services. Um, we say that it, for the purposes of uh, downstream relief on the account, the inquiry, etc., uh, that we want to have those findings uh, explicitly in relation to infringement of the other aspects, just so that there are no, there's no revisionism or temptation to revisionism down the line. I'm not sure I really understand that. If a product infringes a trademark, it means they can't sell the product under that trademark to the extent that they've done it in the past, they're liable for damages. For... Does, it, does it matter how widely <coughs> they infringe it or what further findings of infringement are made? Um, I, I take your Lordship's uh, point. The, our concern is to ensure uh, it's not just uh, to going to the cost point I alluded to earlier. It is for the purposes of, the, of downstream relief. Um, this point is also located in the respondent's notice because, of course, uh, the other side is saying that um, th that the uh, mark should be cut down further or should be cut down leaving only electronic mail services yeah. and uh, telecommunications. The point, the point you want, the point you uh, trail that you're going to make is that you're constrained to identity and not um, similarity. That, that applies in relation to the findings that have been made, doesn't it? So you, um, my, my objection doesn't really apply to that. Well, um, yes. I'm just not sure. I mean, presumably, you're inviting this court to make additional findings. We are, but only on the basis of the um, the judgments and the evidence before the judge. I and mean, we're certainly not saying to take, and take another look and uh, look mm. under the bonnet and uh, uh, yes. get, get involved in the evidence. We say it is um, self certainly if there is a successful appeal um, for Sky uh, in relation to validity, uh, it's almost self evident that the greater includes the lesser and that there mm. uh, is infringement in relation to the original specification. I, mean, I, I, I almost got the verbatim admissions from the CEO of Sky Kick in, in cross examination in relation to those aids. Yes, I'm just you know, reluctant to take up time on points that don't really, really make very much difference to the overall outcome of the case. Well, except insofar as they might be a rearguard, they, they may have more force in relation to the respondent's notice and, yeah. and the reply. Anyway, I'm not trying to stop you, but. Uh... Um, can I address your lordships in relation to this discrete point about identity and similarity? Yes. Um, the, the allegation or the, the, the accusation that's made um, in, in relation, I think it's paragraph 9 of Skykick's appeal skeleton uh, in reply, uh, is that uh, the likelihood of confusion case based on similarity rather than identical goods and services was not seriously advanced at trial. Um, there was Getting into the canon assessment of similarity is now impossible, even if Sky were inviting it, which it was not, and that therefore there's no proper basis for the Court of Appeal to consider similarity. Um, 
as to that, we say, first of all, um, for what it's worth, we have a permission to appeal on ground five, which is explicitly uh, in relation to similarity as well as identity. Um, secondly, for the reasons my learned friend, Mr. Hobbs, uh, has uh, outlined in relation to the INEOS uh, decision, we, don't, we didn't and we don't need evidence of similarity. Uh, there were actually comments in the evidence about the similarity between them, but I think it was accepted as a matter for the judge rather than for the witnesses, um, what, what is uh, similar and what isn't. Uh, but thirdly, uh, this suggestion that it's never really, the point's never been run is wrong, we say. Um, we say that similarity was clearly pleaded throughout. It's in the um, uh, statements of case. It's in the, uh, indeed, in an RFI uh, that was um, served a month before the trial. Um, similarity was accepted by both sides to be an issue at the trial. So in the opening skeletons of both parties, which I can, I'm not going to take your lordships to, um, there's a, both parties set out the issues for the court to determine, and similarity of goods and services is in both lists. Um, thirdly, perhaps it's the, the most uh, important reference is um, we explained in uh, the trial skeleton that our case included the allegation of similarity. Uh, and then fourthly, the judge dealt with and made findings in relation to similarity in the first, the third, and the fourth judgment. So we say uh, this court is in a position, is not shut out uh, from making those conclusions. Uh, can, can I just show you the reference to the uh, to Sky's opening uh, skeleton? It's a uh, Sky 1 tab 14. And it's paragraph 129, which is paragraph 154 of the bundle. Paragraph 156, page 156 of the bundle, apologies. And that cross refers to Annex 2 of the skeleton, which is at page 190. So it's paragraph 129 of the skeleton. Uh, Sky invited the court to compare each of the uh, products to each of the specimen products. That's what we were calling the selected goods and services at that point and determine whether Skykick's product is or falls within the term given for the specimen product. If it is, there's identity, and if not, the court must consider the degree of similarity between the two in the light of the canon factors. This exercise is set out in tabular form in Annex 2, and then in Annex 2, uh, we set out the selected goods and services as they looked at that point, and make our uh, submissions about which of Skykick's products were identical or similar. So in my submission, there can be no suggestion that um, our case has always been all or nothing uh, on the question of identity. <clears throat> the third topic, uh, unless I can assist you further in relation to, to, to identity versus sim similarity, um, the third topic I was proposing to address your lordships on is, is the defendant's products. Um, those are identified in the main judgment at para, uh, paragraph 97, cloud migration, cloud backup, and cloud manager. Um, as your lordships will have seen, the ones that matter are cloud migration, which was the biggest seller at the date of the main judgment, and cloud backup, which was the biggest seller at the date of the fourth judgment. And uh, they are described in uh, paragraph, subparagraph 971, 972, and 973 uh, of the main judgment. And uh, in essence, cloud migration is a uh, software product which uh, migrates email and email boxes and contacts and attachments and things uh, from a customer's uh, legacy IT system to the cloud, to the, um, in, in particular, the Microsoft Office 365 uh, cloud system. And the learned judge says that it's an, it's an affordable product, uh, cost per seat of about £17 then in the EU, 
uh, and it accounted for approximately 60% of Skykick's revenue. Now, the summary of cloud migration and what it does um, can be found in Mr. Schwartz's third witness statement. Uh, the reference to that is uh, Sky Bundle 1, Tab 8. <coughs> He summarizes um, the cloud migration product at paragraphs 8 to 12 and uh, gives a detailed explanation of how it works between paragraphs 23 and 33. Now, I had been proposing to uh, take your lordships through that. I think I shall just say what I, was, what I say um, would have been uh, apparent had I done so. Um, in my submission, it is a software-based email migration service. Part of the software uh, resides in the cloud. That's why Skykit keeps calling this software as a service. Software as a service is just a sort of 2010s buzzword for uh, software which doesn't sit on, the, on, on your desktop. It sits on the internet, sits on a remote server. Um, so part of that software resides in the cloud, but part of the software is downloaded to the client. That's the, the reference to the Skykick Outlook Assistant uh, that your lordships will see in the main judgment and, uh, uh, and throughout the uh, evidence of Mr. Schwartz. And it, what the product does in essence is to transport electronic documents from one place to another. It takes the email messages, the attachments, the contacts from the client's own computers and puts it in the cloud so that from then on you can use a cloud-based um, uh, email system whereas previously you were using uh, a local server uh, email system. So, And we say that that is not just email software as a service, we say it's email software and it is an email service. And it is a telecommunications service. Cloud backup is uh, described by the learned judge at paragraph 97.2 of the main judgment. Again, this is a software as a service based product that provides cloud based backups of Office 365 data. So that is, um, well, let me give you, your lordships, the references. The evidence about it is Mr. Schwartz's third statement again, at this time at paragraphs 13 to 21. That's the summary. And the detail is at paragraphs 34 to 41. And uh, had I taken your lordships to that, it would have demonstrated um, all of the references to backing up MS Exchange, that's Microsoft Exchange email, and documents. So in my submission, this is a software-based electronic document backup service. In essence, it copies electronic documents, whether they be email messages or Word documents, from one place to another, from one part of the cloud to another. And that's why Mr. Schwartz describes it, uh, paragraph 16, as a, a cloud to cloud service. So copies of Office 365 documents are constantly sent from A to B and stored there so that they can be sent back from B to A if they've been lost or if they've been deleted. It's a storage and retrieval service for email and other electronic documents. For completeness, the third uh, product is Cloud Manager. Uh, the learned judge below refers to that at Main Judgment 97.3, uh, but it said that it wasn't. Uh, it was only in beta and therefore hasn't really concerned us uh, for the rest of the um, case. Uh, the, Mr. Schwartz's evidence about it, brief as it is, is at paragraph 22 of his statement. Um, the um, primary evidence about the operation of those products is obviously in uh, Mr. Schwartz's statement. I would draw uh, particular attention to the references to uh, email and documents um, at paragraphs 13 and 14. Your Lordships will have seen in the way that the, uh, the learned judge trimmed down uh, the selected goods and services. Um, often what he's done is, is to introduce the term in relation to audiovisual and or audiovisual content and documents. Sometimes that's the only sort of substantive qualification as between the left-hand column and the right-hand column. Therefore, um, 
we, we say it's important to note that all the way through the evidence of Mr. Schwartz, he talks about the migration of electronic documents and the backup of the electronic documents. These are, uh, and that's why my learned friend Mr. Hobbs says that uh, th these qualifications uh, and the respects in which the uh, terms have been trimmed down uh, make little practical difference uh, to the analysis of infringement. Uh, the other area that we do say um, it, it is relevant to consider is how Skykick themselves described their products. And that's not just in evidence when they knew that this was an infringement action. That was before uh, the infringement proceedings when they were applying for their own um, US trademarks. And this evidence uh, w w was before the judge and it is uh, before your lordships in uh, Sky Bundle 1, Tab 3, uh, at page 11. What your Lordships have here are the statements of use uh, in the USPTO. In the US, if you apply for a trademark, unlike in the uh, EU system, uh, you have to formally attest that the marks are in use. And what we have here are the um, filings that were made by Skykick in relation to their first set of Skykick trademarks. And um, behind tab one, which we don't have time to go to, are the conversations back and forth, the deliberations about what they should apply for. Originally, they wanted to apply for computer software unqualified. But they were warned that might be, um, uh, be overbroad. Uh, but the, what your Lordships see behind tab three is two very similar documents. Um, one of them starts at page 11, one of them starts at page 27. That's because the first one relates to class 9 goods, and the second relates to class 42 services. And the statement of use itself is at page 13 of the bundle. And your lordships will see there um, that the applicant Skykick is submitting the following allegation of use information. Computer software for storage, exchange, I, I'm missing out some words, computer software for storage, exchange, search, retrieval, and migration of email, contacts, documents, etc. And then next paragraph, the mark is in use in commerce on or in relation with all of the goods and services. And then at the next paragraph, second line, the applicant is submitting one specimen uh, for the class showing use of the mark as used in commerce. Over the page at 14 is the solemn declaration <coughs> that, um, that if this is a false statement, it would be punishable by a fine or imprisonment. And then what follows is the specimen of use that was referred to. And this is, uh, in effect, uh, uh, an earlier version of uh, what email migration uh, did. Again, uh, replete, we say, with uh, evidence that um, it's all about moving electronic documents from one place to another. It is uh, promoted and said to be a computer software for storage exchange, search retrieval and migration of email and documents. Uh, and we say that that is material when it comes to uh, the findings of uh, infringement and mapping the use that's been made by Skykick onto the um, specifications that are found to be valid by this court. Given the time, um, I, I think I will just uh, take up the uh, schedule at the back of our skeleton which your lordships may still have open. It's page 49 of 4 1. We say that um, in relation to the, uh, the two products, the learned judge could and should have found uh, infringement not just in relation to um, item 6, electronic mail services, in relation to cloud migration, and item 8, as trimmed down. Uh, computer services, etc., in relation to cloud backup, 
but in relation to all of these selected goods and services, whether trimmed down or not. And that is, in essence, uh, ground five of our uh, grounds for appeal. We say that telecommunications subsumes uh, ele electronic mail services uh, for the reasons uh, that I have given. We say that, um, obviously, self-evidently, uh, this is computer software. My learned friend, Mr. Um, Malinich, says that the software as a service is somehow not software. Um, we, we don't understand that submission, and we say that that's not correct. Uh, even in the case of, um, I I even if we're getting into the niceties of computer software as goods, as opposed to computer software as a service, um, computer software, downloadable computer software, uh, has always been um, classified as class nine goods. I mean, again, like like Mr. Hobbs was saying earlier, I'm not sure we we would have uh, necessarily, uh, if we were writing the system uh, over again from scratch, I'm not sure we'd have necessarily included software uh, as goods. But that's the proper classification uh, under the needs classification. And of course, um, the evidence before the learned judge was that there is download a downloadable component uh, in the form of the Skykick assistant. Uh, and that is used in the majority of migrations, according to uh, the learned judge finding in paragraph 97. Uh, we say that's computer software supplied from the internet. Uh, we say it's computer software to enable connection to databases well, and the internet. But I think just sufficient for computer software to enable connection to databases um, and databases of documents. Well. That, that is, um, in my respectful submission, a pretty good encapsulation uh, of what both of the products do, particularly cloud backup. In relation to data storage, um, the, the, the judge's qualification, again, is in relation to storage of documents. We say that that must uh, include and extend to electronic documents. Uh, and therefore, that's quintessentially what um, cloud backup is uh, doing, but also cloud migration. Uh, in relation to uh, storing the um, email boxes and attachments and contact information and so forth uh, on the cloud. Electronic mail services, um, subject to the NICE classification points, uh, which I won't, which were ventilated earlier, and my learned friend, Mrs. Malinich, is going to major on, and I don't propose to get into. Uh, we say the judge was right to find that email migration is a, an electronic mail service. That is an apt description of it. It's an identical service, we say. And uh, we say that cloud uh, backup is no less uh, an email, an electronic mail service. One of the most fundamental features of cloud backup is Microsoft Exchange backup. It's backing up electronic mail. And that's what Mr. Schwartz says at paragraph 13 uh, of his third witness statement. Uh, then portal services, um, I mean, this, this was perhaps the judge's, uh, the judge was most skeptical in relation to portal services. What is a portal service? Well, it's an internet portal service. It's, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a very 2000 kind of a term. Everyone was into internet portals back at Y2K, just like they're into software as a service now. It's the, the, the sense is it's a place where you, uh, a sort of single outlet that you come to to get access to various services. And uh, it, there's no debate that Skykick have an internet portal. Um, Mr. Schwartz said that he had one in, in cross-examination. He said that he had one in his statement. Uh, what the learned judge said um, at paragraph 297 of the main judgment is he said there was no provision of portal services to third parties. Mm. And therefore, that was... That, that was potentially an impediment to, the, to this claim. Um, my lords, we say that um, that is not correct on the just, evidence. Just having one is enough. Well, we, we don't say that. I mean, it, it's very clear that Mr. Schwartz's evidence is clear that there is a, there is a portal through which you can access um, cloud backup and cloud migration. But, but it, it's, it's more than that. The portals, according to Mr. Schwartz's evidence, and I can, I can demonstrate it time permitting, your lordship, is how partners access the cloud migration and backup services, and they, uh, and they can be rebranded for the downstream customers to use. So Skykick is providing portal services to its, to, to its partners, 
for them to use for their customers. And th 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 there are references to, I, I can just give your lordships the references. Um, it's, uh, these are all in Mr. Schwartz's third witness statement at Sky One Tab 8. It's uh, paragraph 20, figure 4, paragraph 23, paragraph 34, and paragraph 41. In particular, paragraph 41 is the one that talks about Skykick providing a portal for the, to the partner for the customer to access. And there's all that stuff about how it can be rebranded, ac it, it, it's, it's uh, branded Acme in his evidence. And he says that can be rebranded according to uh, the partners or it can just be left as Skykick. So in my submission, um, even in relation to, the, to our most difficult case, uh, internet portal services, we say there was provision and there is provision of portal services to third parties um, uh, as set out uh, in Mr. Schwartz's evidence and just on the face of Mr. Schwartz's evidence. Uh, and then finally, that the, the uh, eight selected goods and service uh, are computer services for accessing um, and retrieving originally information slash data, subsequently um, visual, audio, visual and documents. Uh, from a computer network. Uh, the learned judge said that was identical to cloud backup. We respectfully agree. But we also say that applies uh, to cloud migration. Uh, that, that is uh, a service for accessing and retrieving um, email documents and for uh, transporting those email documents, uh, accessing and retrieving uh, uh, with the cloud and uh, with the legacy computer systems uh, of the customer. Uh, I have cantered through my submissions and I hope we are still on track for time. Um, unless there's anything else that my learned friend, unless, unless there's any way I can assist your lordships further in relation to those points, um, I would propose to sit down subject to anything that uh, Mr. Hobbs has, uh, wishes to pick up. Just so I understand, that was really ground five. That's ground five. Um, what happens about ground six to twelve? Ground six, uh, ground six to eight, I think, is extended protection. Uh, as I understand it, that is a, uh, as pleaded, is is quite a narrow point because the, the the complaint there is that the the learned judge said there is a likelihood of confusion. Therefore, I'm going to consider the extended protection claim on the hypothesis that there is no likelihood of confusion and says, on the hypothesis that there's no likelihood of confusion, there's no extended protection infringement. You don't disagree with that? You, you say you should have found 9C infringement. We say you should have found 9C infringement on, basis that rather than considering it on, on the basis that, that he was wrong, he should have considered it on the basis that he was right. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and seems, seems to be effectively common ground that if he was right. There was 9C infringement, but we'll see what Mr. Well, looks like. I think Mr. Hobbs also has a... Uh... Do you mind if I answer that question? <laughs> it goes like this. The Intel case, and it's particularly paragraph 80. Actually, should we, can I just open it with you? It's only two paragraphs. Um, so can Intel we just take stock one moment? Oh, yes, sir. Um, uh, we've said to go up as far as um, ground five. Um, uh, is it proposed to... Uh, pursue at some stage ground six to twelve in their totality. Yeah, the answer is yes, and then the question is, what is the modus operandi? Yes. Um, I don't know quite how your lordship deals with this in the modern hearings in the Court of Appeal. Would it be acceptable to your lordships if I said, will you take me as read on my skeleton on those? I'm not withdrawing from them. I am supporting. And I'm happy to answer any questions, but if you would wish me to develop them further, there isn't sufficient time today to do so. I see how Sir Christopher feels. <laughs> I think it would be more than reading skeleton. I don't know if you heard that. Uh, I, no, I didn't. I, <laughs> I expect the whole world heard it because they've got these microphones tuned in. Um, uh, I, I think we find attractive the option of reading your skeleton. That's good. <laughs> would, would you find it attractive if I just showed you two paragraphs in the Intel case to show you how this works? At this point, 
The judge has you done. Can t tell us the paragraph numbers. <laughs> we'll, we'll read them overnight rather than being. <coughs> just, okay, so, just, if you just give me a second, Ben, while I find the paragraph numbers. First of all, Intel is in Authorities 1 at Tab 8. It's paragraphs 57 and 58. I'll read you paragraph 57, just the first line. Finally, a link between the conflicting marks is necessarily established when there is a likelihood of confusion. Yes. So it goes like this. The, the I don't know why the judge does it. He's done it more than once, and I've had other cases in which we put in grounds of appeal and then it didn't go to an appeal hearing. The judge wants to make the extended protection category operate in a compartment of its own. And for that purpose, therefore, he approaches it on the basis that I'm going to pretend I haven't found that there's a likelihood of confusion, and I'm then going to assess the 10-3 case, the extended protection case, as if there wasn't. The, that's the absolute converse of what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to consider whether there's a 10-3 case, and in the course of it, take account of the fact that there's the existence of a likelihood of confusion, and go further. To the extent that there isn't a likelihood of confusion, you're supposed to consider whether there is beyond that still nonetheless undue detriment or taking of unfair advantage. And, and it doesn't stop with the subtraction or the addition of the unfair uh, of the uh, likelihood of confusion. But again, does it, does it matter? In infringement is infringement. That's what comes out at the end of the sausage machine. Yes. <clears throat> There's an injunction to prevent infringement. And uh, inquiry as to damages for infringement. Okay, that, uh, that, that, if you don't mind me saying so, is a pretty, what do I should I say, sensitive point. Um, my Lord, Lord Justice Newey was um, presiding in a case, no, Lord Justice Longmore was presiding in a case. My Lord, Lord Justice Newey was um, the number two member of the court, and Sir Timothy Lloyd was the number three member of the court. There's a case called Trinity Logistics and Wharf. Now, we, we used to say without any qualification that the appeal is always against the outcome, the result. Mm. So it's infringement, end of. Uh, the Court of Appeal, as we read, and practitioners read Trinity Logistics and Wharf, it's 2018 EWCA SIV 2765. As we read that case, particularly paragraphs 85 to 89 in the judgment of Sir Timothy Lloyd, if you if you got a result which is favourable to you, but you nonetheless, in the process of getting it, didn't get a claim upheld. If you want the Court of Appeal to say that the claim you didn't get in your favour should be upheld, you have to actually appeal. Even if you're a respondent, you have to appeal. If you want a reversal of the result. Now, what do I want? How else, I have to ask rhetorically, how else do I get to the Court of Appeal if a judge hasn't decided the whole of the case? He's done part of it and come to a result on part of it. How else do I get to the Court of Appeal if he hasn't done the rest of it? Now, in Comic Enterprises, which is Mrs. Bundles, the Court of Appeal was perfectly content to consider that the judge at first instance, Mr. Roger Wyan, sitting as a deputy, hadn't finished the job on similarity. We say the judge here didn't finish the job on similarity and he didn't finish the job, didn't really approach it correctly, but didn't finish it on extended protection. He's given me permission. Um, if your lordships, your lordships I, will deal with it. I gave you permission. Starting to oh yes, you, you did. You did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Does any of that? Thank you, my lord. <laughs> that, does Wolf and Trinity Logistics explain why it matters? Well, why does it matter? When you when you go to an inquiry, so you, you want your compensation, and there's been an order, and we've elected for an inquiry so far. The inquiry has to be comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have experienced, as my learned friend Mr. Roberts said, every time there isn't something in black and white in a judgment that leaves the point open, they say, oh, you haven't won on it. Now, there's an answer in the patent cases, and my lord, uh, in, uh, without, without in any way being impertinent, my lord Sir Christopher Floyd will, will be familiar with the point. There was a time when I was younger when you couldn't say that you could make the scope of the inquiry go into matters that hadn't been determined on the main action. Judges have taken a more relaxed view progressively in recent times in copyright cases and also speaking patent cases. 
not that I'm aware of in trademark cases, but the principle ought to be the same. Provided that the court is willing to say you're not shut out, you can subtend beneath the finding of infringement anything you say m violates the uh, right, and you can do it on the inquiry. So you can broaden the issues on the inquiry without having the issues determined on the main claim. Now, um, that has happened in patent cases, and it's happened, I think, progressively more than it did when I was much younger than I am today. So it is an option for your lordships. If your lordships were to accept the principle that the judge did not decide enough on the, like, on the similarity case, did not decide enough on the extended protection case, to say so, and then to say that there should therefore be no limitation uh, on an inquiry going ahead on the infringement which has been found. I expect I'm still missing the point. Uh, I mean, it, it, if infringement is infringement, why do you need to go further for the purposes of an inquiry? Um, there are three ways of infringing a claim uh, under the Trademarks Act, and then in fact, you could you could mount you could mount a claim for infringement on any one of them. There's what they call double identity, which is the A clause, which is the goods and the mark goods and services and the marks are identical. It's not the case. Alternatively, there's the B clause. I say alternatively, there is the B clause. And at the moment, you've got a B clause. Outcome, have you? We've got a B clause outcome. And if you've got a C clause outcome, would it be any different? We, well, we, yes, it should be. If the judge had done the job properly as our submission, he wouldn't have done this skewed analysis which said, I'm going to pretend no, I'm that. Yeah. But if you, when you got to the inquiry, would it be different? Yes, because you can have compensation for taking unfair advantage or inflicting uh, undue oh. detriment, whether or not you cause confusion. Yes, that's it. It adds. It's a claim, it's a claim in its own right. You, you are saying it should have gone on to decide that there was C infringement without confusion. With or without, it's both. Right. And he should, first of all, he should have got the infringement uh, on B correct. Mm. He, 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 short, he stopped short on that. Once you've got the, the infringement on B correct, then you have to ask what's left that's not covered when you get to C. And when you get to C, you have to ask yourself whether there is a beyond what has been covered by the B clause, whether there's an infringement liability. So yes. Now, I, I don't feel very attracted by the idea of asking your lordships to bend over the papers and, 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 and study closely all the details of this, that, and the other. Mr. Roberts has explained to you very succinctly why those itemizations in that table at the back all produce an infringement mm. case. All of them, not just the one that the judge singled out uh, which was it? Electronic mail services, I think, was his preferred one with a, with a, with a soup song of telecommunication services. The, the judge hasn't finished the job on the B clause and similarity. He hasn't, therefore, finished or even perhaps started correcting the C clause. That's, that's the point. Yes, it's nice. He said that there wasn't infringement on the C. On the, on the no, he C. changed his mind in the final order. He said there was. This is this, this is. I distinctly remember the moment. Right. So by the time we got to paragraph fifty-six, little Roman two, of the fourth judgment, the judge recognised that the claim for extended protection had succeeded. Quotes in the technical sense. Yes, with confusion. Well, but are you are you saying we've got to go on and decide without confusion? That's yes, but there is a there is a. Be the role of confusion when you get to the C clause is that it points to the existence of a link. Yes, I fully understand that. But right. I just want to and know you what did. you're asking us to do. Are you asking us to reverse the judge? No. I'm asking you to expand the judge. Right. I want, I, I, if you really wouldn't mind, please, would you give me... I feel I've been shortchanged by the shopkeeper in the court below, my lord. Right. I've got a B clause which is broader than he found definitely broader than he found. He was very parsimonious. With that in mind, please turn to the C clause, factor in what I've just read you from the Intel case, and say there is a C case. It's not confined to the situation where there's confusion, but it includes it. Mm. That's my point. Now, I, I mean, I, I wobble at the knees at the idea that I'm asking um, three members of the Court of Appeal then to, to do very detailed exercise of the kind that that might ultimately envisage. But I've just offered you what you might like to consider, which is to say that there was a broader basis than the judge recognised, 
would be fine then when I come forward to the inquiry and seek compensation because then I have every tool I need in my toolbox. At the moment, I don't. There's a spanner or two missing. I think we should leave things there for tonight. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that, and thank you for the indication that you'll take it off the skeleton uh, and the grounds of appeal on, on, on those grounds. Um, I, I won't expect to rise tomorrow unless there's anything that you want to press me further on, having thought about it overnight. Yes. Th thank you for your uh, So, 10.30 in the morning. Much right. Court rise. <laughs>